In today's show, I'm going to take a look at straight arm locks, Udigatami and Wakigatami. So if you want to know a little bit more about those straight arm locks, keep watching. Okay, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Freestyle Judo. I am Steve Scott, and we are going to do two things today. We're going to look on straight arm locks, and I'm going to do a book review. Uh, first, a little tease here of what comes a little later, the straight arm locks. These are kind of the um, not-so-cool arm locks, I, I guess some people think. Uh, and, and some people kind of glance over them and look over them. Wakigatami, the armpit lock, and Udigatami, the arm lock, or the straight arm lock. And... They're, they're, they're not real fancy or cool, but they just really work. So I hope today I can convince you to really spend a little more time studying these arm locks because they are, they're really efficient, they're very effective. We have uh, quite a number of videos on them, so we're going we're to get into that a little later. But uh, the straight arm locks, so we're going to talk about that, different types of arm locks a little later as well. Right now, though, I want to do a book review. And um, I warned you some time ago on another episode that I, I like book reviews, so I'm going to do another one here today. So please keep watching. Um, even if you're not a big reader, you should be. In fact, as I think everybody in martial arts, no matter what it may be, whether it's judo, sambo, jiu-jitsu, taekwondo, no matter what you do, um, you should have a, a big library of books. And you should read them and reread them and study them because they are valuable. Now, this tool we have right here, this video, fabulous stuff. You know, use, use any, any media you can to study and improve your skills. But reading is also a great one. It's a very active thing, reading is. So uh, have a good library. That's all I can say. I, I would just think it's wonderful. But another thing I will say is this book here, Meditations on Violence. Okay, that is a great book. And I want to go over it a bit here. It's 181 pages. I don't know Sergeant Miller. I'm not getting compensated for this book review. I'm just telling you it is the best book I have read on real-world self-defense ever in over 50 years of my involvement in this. My background is, besides the sport aspect of it and all this, is I've, I've done a lot of training in law enforcement and defensive tactics, and I've done a lot of self-defense classes. I mean, serious stuff. And I know a lot of you have too, but but I, I really uh, I got into the, the study of it, the sociology of it as well. And I've, I've interviewed a lot of victims of, of violence, and it's just, it's it's sad to see what goes on in this world. And Sergeant Miller talks about that in his book, and it is uh, like I said, meditations on violence. Quite a quite a sobering name to begin with, and it's it's packed full of great information. Sergeant Miller's background is he's. A number of different martial arts, including judo, and he is um, uh, was a, a corrections officer for a number of years. So he had a lot of firsthand experience dealing with with some real world tough tough people, rough people. And he, he brings it out in his book. And he, I think his background is a psychology background or something as well. So he really knows what he's talking about from that end as well. So he really discusses, uh, you know, why and how. Uh, violent ev uh, events happen and, and wh why, why violence occurs and, and how to deal with it realistically. It's a very pragmatic book. So I want to cover some topics here, some bullet points. So I'll be looking down at my notes here. And if they don't seem to make sense, I'll try to make sense of them anyway. Uh, first of all, it is, like I said, 181 pages. You can get it through YMAA Publications. They are my public publishing house as well, and I'm not doing this to get compensated from them or anything. Uh, they just put out great books, and this is one of them. Um, and again, it's called Meditations on Violence. I'm going to go over some things I got out of it, okay? Uh, first of all, what really hit home, and sometimes it kind of, I mean, it really hits home, he was very frank about this. Uh, there are a lot of myths about martial arts training, okay? I mean, just because you're a black belt in something doesn't mean you're the toughest guy on the block. Now, it may mean you're the toughest guy on the block, but a lot of times it doesn't either. And there are a lot of really bad, tough guys and mean people out there who don't have any martial arts training, and, and they, uh, they're violent and they're rough, and um, if you're not prepared for them in a realistic way, 
no matter what degree black belt you have, they will hurt you. Okay, so uh, he, he hits home very, very succinctly and very candidly about self-defense training as opposed to martial arts training. Um, we like to think they're the same thing, not always. Okay, and you know, not everything's a cool flowing movement where this leads to that, that leads to this. A fight's a staccato situation. Um, it, things happen, and they, they happen here, then they happen here. They're unexpected. This happens. That's self-defense. That's real fighting. Okay, that that could also be in a situation in a, a boxing match or a judo match or anything else too. But it, it's not the beautiful flow you see some of these instructors do. And he really hits home on that. You know, he says, step up your game as far as your training, make it more realistic. I really like that, actually. He also really provides a critical and very pragmatic examination and analysis of violent behavior, okay? Um, the nature of violent behavior, uh, what leads up to it. I, 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 like, I like some of his, um, the way he describes the way people act. I mean, he hits it on the head. Uh, I know from my own personal experience dealing with some kind of violent characters through the line of work I used to be in, um, he describes how some of these guys act, and and they're, it, it's it's almost primal, you know, it's, it's primitive, and he describes it to a to a T exactly what goes on. It's very good. I don't want to give it away. I want you to read the book. You'll know what I see. You'll know what I mean when you read the book. Okay, all right. He also talks about the dynamics. And what actually happens the, in, the, in the act of a physical encounter? What, what goes on, the, the emotional, the physical, the mental, um, cultural, all, all aspects of a real physical encounter? You know, I'm not talking about a, a street fight. It could be a street fight. But, you know, what happens during that? What are the physical, you know, manifestations of what goes on? He talks about that in detail, and it's, it's just brilliantly. He also maybe alluded to this earlier. He talks about the aftermath of of a physical uh, violent encounter. You know, the cultural, the emotional, the physical, um, uh, the mental. You know, certainly the emotional, uh, the, the, the whole the whole gamut of what a victim of this has goes through after being raped, beaten, abused in some way. Um, and it's not pretty. And, uh, you know, he cites a lot of statistics and a lot of real world um, things that happened. And, you know, I've looked these up too. You know, if, if you, want some, you want some depressing reading, go to the Department of Justice Statistics on Crime, and it will sadden you. And obviously he's done that to a great degree here, and he, he backs up everything he says with solid, solid background and statistics and everything. He's, he's got good references, so he, he really knows what he's talking about. Um, he also talks about, and he analyzes, um, you know, how to adapt realistically uh, your training, you know, you know, how to make it more effective. And, and I, I like that part of it. He just doesn't criticize about what we're doing wrong. He offers some very constructive uh, uh, tips and ideas on, on how, to, how to make your training more effective for really teaching and really preparing somebody for self-defense. Great stuff. Um, again, it's real world, very pragmatic in its approach. And finally, you know, what I, what I, what I like about it is that, um, it's well-written. He's a good writer and it's written in a way that's very engaging. You want to turn to the next page because you want to see what he says next. And I like that, you know, it's not just full of statistics and gloom and doom. It is a well-written book. So, you know, I would highly recommend Meditations on Violence. Again, I'm going to hold it up here. Again, it is um, 181 pages, uh, listed at retail at $18.95. You can get it from YMAA Publications. Uh, you can also get it on Amazon. Again, I get no compensation for this, but I certainly tell you what, the best book I've read on self-defense ever. Okay, so that being said, let's move on. All right, let's move on to straight arm locks. Now, there are three types of straight arm locks, at least that, you know, that most people do that I know of. There's Jujigatami, which is the cross-body arm lock, which is, like I said, a whole earlier bit of the show, a, a whole different bundle of different something. It's its its its, its own animal. I love it. It's my favorite arm lock, and, uh, you know, we've done other shows on it. I've written books on it. 
So I'm not going to say anything more about that in this show here, but I am going to talk about the other two types of straight arm locks, the ones that, that don't get as much publicity, you know, certainly from guys like me. And it's Udigatami, the first one, arm lock, the straight arm lock. That's a generic name for it. And Wakigatami, the armpit lock, uh, the side of the torso type. It's the armpit area lock. So we're going to look at those today, those two, Wakigatami, armpit lock, Udigatami. Now, again, they differ from uh, another arm lock, which is like Udigarami, arm entanglement, the bent arm lock. That's a different type of arm lock it's a we, you basically have two types of arm locks either they're straight or they're bent and um you know i think everything every type of arm lock falls into one of those two categor categories so um you know that's a different show okay we've done udigarami shows so but we're going to talk about udigatami wakigatami now so anyway let's let's compare the two of them before we get into what they are uh, you know the, the, the actual videos of them here they're basically you straighten the opponent's arm and you lever, you know, his elbow against something, some, a fulcrum you provide. Okay. Now in Udigatami, it could be any number of things. It could be your, your arm itself. It could be your leg. It could be any part of your body. So it's a more generic thing, Udigatami. And when we approach Udigatami, we, we call it straight arm lock it's it's any arm lock that's pretty straight you know pretty much a straight arm lock now a variation of that i think but it's but it has its own value too is walkie gatami now the walkie is the side of your body kind of under your armpit area and that's the part when you pull your opponent's arm straight and you lever it against your walkie okay your armpit area so that makes it a walkie gatami so that makes it a little different, obviously, than it's very specific approach to doing Udigatami then. Okay, so that's why they are classified differently in Kodokan Judo, and I think rightly so. It's a good idea, actually. Okay, as again, we know Jujigatami is levered against your pubic bone. Okay, and that's that makes it different from Wakigatami or Udigatami. So that's, that's the difference in the three straight arm locks. So anyway, the first uh, arm lock we're going to look at is the fundamental one, the Udigatami. And the, what we're going to do here is the first, uh, the first uh, video is how I would teach it. In fact, the, the order of how I teach them is, is what we're doing it here. So if you were coming to my club and learning Udigatami from me, you would learn it like this way first, okay? And we teach it from uh, Kesagatami, from the arm or from the uh, uh, scarf hold. And we like to do it because Kesa Gatami provides a good base, a good platform that we can uh, apply Udigatami from. There are a lot of guys get caught with this kind of Udigatami, this, this straight arm lock from a Kesa Gatami. They get caught cold. So uh, teaching it from a pin gives the student a good base to work from, and it, it allows him uh, a very practical, pragmatic, offensive weapon in Udigatami. So that's why I teach it first. That's why I teach this type of Udigatami first. So this first video shows Derek uh, showing the guys one night. I caught it on video about uh, just, just doing an Udigatami kind of session here. I think we show three or four different applications of it. There are a lot of different ways to do it, but we're showing three of the four basic ones. So we're going to look at that one. It's about a little over three minutes right now. So let's take a look at Udigatami from a Kesagatami or pinning situation. Now more very, like alternate grips for it. So if I come through here and I have this, a lot of times we start getting into straightened arm territory or he's turning back that way. He's getting out of it to where I can't get my, my arm underneath. Or even sometimes when I do do this, he, it's way out here and he'll still manage to straighten it. So you're like, ah, it's not working. Okay, so what we're gonna do is alternate ways to hit it. And it's not gonna be a bent arm lock anymore. It's gonna be more uh, urigatami you know, the arm bar would be what we're going to be hitting here. So the easiest one, usually when I do this, they know what's going on and they straighten the arm because they're like, that's how you defeat the bent arm lock. So as soon as he does that, you stick your knee on top of it and you just squeeze your knees together. Okay. If you want to be extra mean about it, okay, you pull his head up and then you squeeze. Okay. If you don't really like that, as soon as it goes there, you put your foot on it. Okay and you do it that way, okay? Or, let's see, what was the third one? Oh, wait, that's right. So 
So there's there, and we can just push it down if you want. But you don't, you're not always gonna get that one. So if you push and it's not working, start leg assisting. Okay, and the important part is that my knees are doing that. Okay, even when I'm using my foot, okay, I'm still bringing that knee up. So we isolate, okay, and don't let go of the arm because then he's gonna turn his, there you go, and he's out, okay? So again, alternate grips, we're going here, okay? He straightens his arm, okay? I put my knee on it, squeeze my knees together, okay? Put my foot on it, squeeze my knee up, okay? Use my hand. And then, the, ah, that was it, the third and final one, okay? That time, what we're doing is I hook it like that with my other leg, and then you pop your hips forward. But again, hold on to your pin. If I'm just doing this, he's out, okay? And even if he's not smart enough to do that, okay, I'm, I'm losing my leverage. I can do this all day long, and it just scoots with me. If I keep the hold in there, okay, that keeps him from moving forward. Now, what you're doing... It... Eric's elbow is literally being barred by your, his leg, his uh, left arm is across your left leg. Right. You know, so put your arm out there, Eric. Okay. So there's a bar, and now your right leg is gonna provide the power to drive it yep. and create that, there's the Fulkerman lever and everything there. Okay, so again, all right, straight, knees together, foot, hand, okay. Hold Often on. you'll find that third one that he just did is probably the one that you, Probably your go-to move. Right. That's the one by because you you have that extra, extra uh, level of control mm -hmm. by hooking with your right leg over his arm, right. and it it helps pin him continue to pin him, oh, yeah. and then just add the pressure by going down with and him. There's Derek did a, did a good job on that, so I can't really add anything to it. And again, if you were coming to my dojo, that's how I would teach it first. I recommend teaching that to everyone, you know, if you're a coach, teach that as the primary way to doing it because it does make a lot of sense and it has very practical value in it. Now, the second way is a figure four application. It's a very old application. You see it in pro wrestling and you see it in catch wrestling. You see it in different types of, of uh, jujitsu as well. And... Um, the figure four is basically your figure four. You'll see the video here. It's about a two minute, 15 second video. And again, we're just covering the basics of it, but we're showing kind of a setup for it as well. So we're, we'll show that right now. The, the figure four application of Udi Gatami. And can you kind of show that, show the arm work there with the. So basic overhook, come back around right underneath the joint. Come up and grab your own wrist, put your hand on the bicep, put your pressure from your knee onto a sternum, and then boost your leg just so that you're, you're remaining mobile. Arch your back and they'll tap out with their okay. overreach with their, uh, their gripping hand right here. Okay, I might have tried to pry this off and it's, it's not getting me anywhere, and he's just staying on me like glue. Okay, I can't stand up, I can't pry arms off, so what I'm gonna do is, okay, fine, if you wanna stay nice and tight, we'll stay in tight. So I'm gonna grab this, this wrist and loop over, okay? And we've got a nice Udi Garami here, and he'll immediately think that I'm gonna try and like, turn and bend. But what I'm gonna do instead is I'm going to hit my side and then bar it, okay? So now that I'm on my side, I can actually bar this. My back is locking his shoulder so that he can't twist around too much. Okay, boom, right there. His idea to get out of it is to try and do that and then grip. So that's why I want to be right here because as he does this, I can still pop that free. Boom, right there, okay? Because I've got his part of his shoulders blocked. And if this still isn't working, Okay, you basically use your leg. Guys, this is a classic figure four position of Uday Gatami. Uday, straight arm lock. Uday means arm, Gatami means lock. And we call it the straight arm lock generally. That's a classic, very old variation of it. You probably saw it in pro wrestling as a kid, you know? So it works pretty well. And if you have to, you just add
And I got to tell you, that is a sneaky form of Utigatami. You can really catch a guy unaware with that that thing, and it, that, that's why we showed it here. So, it again, it's very old, but just because it is, don't discount it. You know, like they say, it's so old fashioned, it's cool. It still works. Okay. Again, there are other applications of doing that figure four from different pins and different directions and so on. You know, we, we showed it just from one direction. You can show it from another across the body as well. But, but that being said, you got the idea on the figure four application. There are a lot of ways to do it. This third video is short. It's about 50 seconds long or a little less. And it is the basics of what I call the elbow trap uh, Urigatami. And if you're an old hand like me, this was the first application of Urigatami that I learned. Okay. And a lot of people have done Kodokan Judo that it, this probably was your first exposure to Udigatami. So let's take a look at that. By the way, it's some background noise in this video. Um, the guys were practicing uh, one, one, one afternoon. It was an afternoon practice, I think. And it was, it was the old community center where we were training and uh, some background noise there. And I had Derek just show real quickly just how to do the, the elbow trap basics. So um, here we go. Go ahead, Derek, and just go ahead and run through it. Okay, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to take something that's uh, more of a kata style version of it, which is no control over the body, no pain, but we squeeze our head into our shoulder, trapping the wrist as we get a figure four grip and squeeze in. Traditionally, you grab the elbow and pull in that way. But usually what I'll do is I'll get the figure four with my forearm, step over the head, and then squeeze in, just elevate your shoulders. It's a good way to control them, make sure they don't run, roll out of it or pull their arm out. That is the very basic way of doing Udigatami or the straight arm lock. Again, I apologize for that background noise on that short video, but uh, I think you got the idea of how to do the elbow trap Udigatami from it. Okay, this fourth video is about a minute and a half long. It is my friend, friend Bill Montgomery teaching a uh, another oldie but goodie. Uh, variation of Udigatami at John Saylor's training camp in, in Perrysville, Ohio one year. And it is from a standing position. And it is a very good uh, approach and a sneaky approach. And like Bill says in the video, before you try to, you know, figure out how to beat this or, you know, the, you know figure the holes for it, uh, try it. It is a sneaky move and does work. So I'll let Bill Montgomery explain that. So right now, here we go. You're here, you start to come in, and the person straightens their left arm like this. You simply go down this way, come in here, here, lock it, and pull them down. Okay? And before you start thinking about how you can stop this and get out of it, just try it, because there's, there's a couple things going on here. I come in, he goes here, I come down this way, right? I turn into him, I come over, now watch it when I come back, I come back, I'm upright. If you bend over, the guy has never done a one arm sumigation in his life, and that's what he's going to do. Again, it's here, here, and here. That's not it. Here, here. Watch, 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 watch. Watch what I do. My body turning. Is what does the lock. Everyone thinks they come in, bam, here you go. It's a waste of time. Not only is it a waste of time, he's going to put you on your head. Okay? Here. Here. Turn back in. So again, that was a short minute and a half or so, but I, th I think you got the idea of Bill doing that. By the way, we have a longer video on that uh, that we'll be showing on our, our YouTube channel, um, if it's not showing now, of Bill Montgomery doing that. And, and we do have longer videos of all these uh, applications of Udigatami on our YouTube channel, so I do want to tell you about that. But you got an idea how to do Udigatami. Again, there are other applications, other variations of it. These are the four that I think are the most important for people to learn and to teach. And from that, you can branch out.
if I branch out. Now let's compare that to Wakigatami. Like I said earlier, this is a more specific straight arm lock because you're levering his elbow, prying his elbow against your Waki, your armpit area. And the first video here is just under four minutes long, and it's worth it because John Saylor is teaching it, and he's showing the basics of how to do Wakigatami. So let's look at that right now. Sometimes when a guy rolls in and he's insistent, keep rolling, sometimes I can extend this arm and just keep coming with it to here. See a Wakigatami, a very simple hold. Now, several possibilities. I'm leaning forward on his arm so that the upper part of my chest is on his tricep, on his upper arm. So that eliminates movement. And then I move the lower part of his arm towards my chest. Some guys bend their arm towards me this way to get out. And I don't use the gi because I've been, we've been wrestling a lot without the gi. And I put his wrist in the crook of my elbow, join my arms together and create a uh, Udigarami this way. I guess it's an Udigarami. It's kind of a catch wrestling move. So from Udigarami, or from Udi Wakigatami right yeah. here, he bends backwards and I get the crook of my elbow there. I, I just do a key lock with my hands, a gable grip, and I rotate. Notice how I make my body do the rotation. I'm not doing my arms. I just tilt my body a little bit, and that creates the hole, all right? Uh, so that's a possibility. So I just pull it, okay? I pull it out and sit in, right here. And there we are, same thing, or right here, okay? So I was late, but if he's getting up and he's pushing off the ground, I'm gonna snatch it and pull it out, sit in, and just execute a very, these are very simple moves. These are basic moves. Thanks. Okay? But still, you can catch people during those transitional moments, right when they're turning. Once he gets all balled up, it's very difficult to get any submission like that. But as they turn in, try to keep the arm coming, or if he gets to all fours and he's pushing himself up, right, just scoop it out. Now, when you sit through, Notice I didn't break David's arm. There's a reason. And for the sake of drill, I do this. You might not do it in a world championship or something. That you pull. I put my arm down. Now, that's an unnecessary step if your only goal in life is to win trophies and medals. You know, the chances are you're going to break his arm or tear up his connective tissue. So put your elbow down for the sake of your partner sit through in the position, apply the hold gradually. If you're getting this kind of action, like a pump handle, an old fashioned pump handle, you're not applying the lock to the elbow. It may cause discomfort on his shoulder or whatever, but if you wanna lock the elbow, you gotta isolate it. And since I'm a heavy guy, I lean forward with my, my ribs on top of his tricep. That eliminates movement. Now I move his lower, his wrist, and I don't need much. Play the drum solo that you got a Davida. Stuff like okay. that. So Jack? he manages to get up. I wanted to get it beforehand, but he was too quick and he's here. So I just snatch it, but to save his arm, I post my elbow and I just sit through. And this way we can practice next week. And and, and tomorrow and the next day without hurting each other, you know, take care of your guys. All right. I cannot add anything to what John said, and I, but I do want to say this. I totally agree with him. Wakigatami can be a very dangerous technique. So when you practice it, don't land heavy on his elbow. And that leads to this discussion right here. A wakigatami, the fall down version, the standing wakigatami, what's called fall down wakigatami, is illegal certainly in judo, and I think it's illegal in sambo as well. And if it's not illegal in other sports, it should be, because serious injuries can re can revolt result from a 
doing wakigatami from a standing, immediately taking your opponent down to the ground. And you say, well, if you do it with control, yes. But like John said, if all you're interested in is winning medals, then you're going to hurt your opponent. There's some people out there, and this is why they've had to ban this from competition. There's some people who had no regard for their opposition, and they did the fall down wakigatami, and upon, upon impact on the mat, the arm broke. It is a dangerous way to do it. I don't even teach the fall down or standing wakigatami. It is that dangerous. So I recommend other people don't do it as well. So that's why I'm not showing the video of it. Okay, so the second version. I'm teaching this. It's about a two and a half minute video. It's the front application of Udi or of Wakigatami. And again, John showed the basic from, from behind, from like a ride position, from, you know, if you knocked him down on the side, from setting him at sitting through. This is a sit through application as well, but from the front when your opponent is facing you. He's grabbed your leg. He's probably going to try to do a go behind. Uh, it, it's, it's a realistic situation. So this is the second application of Wakigatami. So let's take a look at it right now. So he's grabbed my leg for whatever reason, bam, okay, trap. First thing is block here. My second point is, as soon as I drive this in, I want the elbow into his armpit, wham, post out. I've got a base now, okay? And I sit through and see how I'm driving it. Now at this point, I can grab and yank it out. Walk to get time. Now, sometimes we, you know, I may have snapped him down, he shot in, I sprawled, whatever. We're ending up here. He somehow grabbed, or I might have him dominating, and dominating him like this. He, he'll, he'll be grabbing my, with his arm around my, my leg here. Maybe to do a go behind or something and switch out, something like that. Cool, that's fine. So here we are. He's in a vulnerable, well, very vulnerable position. Okay, because what I'm going to do is just sit through, and, I, and there's a series of arm locks you can do from here. We'll keep them pretty fundamental tonight, so they work quite well. But He's grabbing me. See that? His head's on the outside of my hip. He knows what he's doing. He knows he knows how to fight. Okay, so I, I gotta remember this. What I want to do is from this position, snatch the elbow. First thing, he's got control of me. I want to take the back control of the situation. I want I want to get control of the situation. So snatch the elbow, just, just block it with your hand. That starts the movement, okay? As soon as you do that, a couple things will happen now. Okay? I want to put my elbow in his armpit, and as I do that, I'm going to post out. See, I got a, kind of a tri tripod going here. Here, here, and here. Okay? Now, I, I catch him here. Now, what's going to happen, I'm going to sit through, and the movement of my, my body is going to pop his arm out free. When I sit through, I lean into him to see how that comes out. Okay? Now, I have my options where I want to go with this. Okay? The most obvious one is, is to scoop his arm, trap his arm up like this, and catch it, catch it. And bam, you've got a nice waki gatami. Waki in Japanese means the side of your torso. It's usually translated to mean armpit. So it's often called the armpit lock. Waki, armpit, lock, gatami. And there it is, palms up. That's the basic, you see how I'm doing it? And I'm leaning into him and cranking. His elbow is right on the side of my body here in my ribs. And I pull up and I crank. Again, we're doing this way. That's the most obvious one. It, and while it's the most fundamental, You'll probably see this most often, too. If you do those two types of wakigatamis, those two basic applications, there are many others. There are a lot of different applications. There are different variations of it. But those will give you a good base to go from. And, again, we have these uh, videos on our YouTube site, our YouTube channel. Uh, but uh, you get a, get a taste of how to do them from, uh, from the from one side and from the front side, from the back side, from the front side. And uh, like I said, you can do a lot of variations and applications of them. Wakigatami is a very sneaky arm lock. Udigatami is a very sneaky arm lock. They come out of nowhere. They literally come out of nowhere. And you can really catch a good guy unaware. Um, it, just a split second is all it takes to do it. It doesn't take a lot of setup. It just happens. And it's kind of, they're very much kind of, kind of like a throwing technique. It, explosive movement, pop, it happens, you got them. So that's Udigatami. It's Wakigatami. Both are, like I said, so old-fashioned they're cool, but I really highly recommend training in them, practicing them, take them seriously. And from time to time, again, they may not be your mainstay, but have them in the arsenal. They, they really will build that arsenal, and, and it'll be something you can pull out of your hat, totally unexpected, get a quick win with it. So there you go.
All right, that about wraps up this show. I do appreciate you tuning in, and thank you for watching all of our videos on our YouTube channel, and I will see you next time.